<laughs> so hi everybody and welcome to episode 164 of Level Up, 60 minutes of live Q&A where your questions of course drive the show. Ella and Shanice actually today are over in the social chat and I can see them already active over there. So please do let them know your name and of course the city from where you're joining around the world. They're going to post some links so that you can vote up the questions that you would most like answered and of course for you to be able to add your own and if your question is selected and put to the panel, then your name's going to appear in the credits at the end of the show. So do get those questions in early and stay with us to see all of that happening. Um, as we continue to build out our production here on Level Up, um, today is actually our second test day for the electronic hand raise panelists. So do watch out for this little symbol appearing in the panel view from time to time, kind of as we go through the show. Okay, now then, with OpenAI's chat GPT sparking, I think, a global debate on the role of computers and the way in which they interact with human beings and on artificial intelligence in particular, we felt that it was time to get an early view on how to make the best use of this technology in your career. AI, of course, promises significant productivity improvements, but are we at risk of overusing it? A little bit like that clip art that people fell in love with in the 1990s. If you're as old as me, you might remember that happening. Where should we be considering using it? And where should we be championing actually investing in becoming better humans to differentiate ourselves from the machines? To help us today make sense of all of this, we've got a really great panel. So let's jump straight in and meet them. Stefan Brendel is the regional lead for Europe here at APMG International. Um, his career, of course, has spanned one of the most dynamic periods in technology development. And he is both a board member of the Best Practice User Group and also of the ITSMF in Germany. Welcome back to Level Up, Stefan. Lovely to have you today. <sighs> Hi, Nick, and hello, panel, and uh, hello, audience, and thanks for the invitation here. I'm really looking forward to this topic, and there's uh, one quote from Stephen Hawking that, remember, that I try to remember, which is that, that AI is probably the best or the worst thing that can happen to humanity. <laughs> Absolutely. Those moments of truth, aren't there, when you look at something and you think, oh, oh, that doesn't feel quite right, you know, and so on. So, yeah, we'll explore that a little bit. Thank you, Stefan. Welcome. Ahmed Javed is the CEO of um, Satellite, who specialise in cybersecurity business resilience. Um, and, of course, strategic leadership. Now, with a strong digital transformation consulting background, Ahmed focuses on bringing together business and technology into cohesive outcomes for his clients. Welcome back to Level Up, Ahmed. Lovely to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you for having me here. And I look forward to engage the audience and the respected panelists in such a wonderful discussion which is a very hot topic coming forward, which is artificial intelligence. And there is a saying is that there is no AI without IA. And that I will explain later what is IA. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. That's really great. Jan Villa Middleburg joins us. He's the CEO of Cybint, of course, over in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He's a serial author, I think it's fair to say, um, his latest book being the Enterprise Big Data Framework. And it's really led him down the path of pioneering the professionalization. Is that a real word? I think it is. I'm going to use it anyway, of automation in big data. Um, he's a frequent keynote speaker, community contributor, and a great inspiration to all of us. So it's an absolute pleasure to welcome him back to Level Up. Jan Willem, great to see you again. Thank you, uh, Nick, and thanks so much for the kind introduction and the kind words, as always. Um, very happy to be uh, collaborating with APMG on this panel. Um, I think the topic that you have provided for today is spot on AI is on everyone's mind. So uh, looking forward to discussing this topic with everyone here to uh, have to learn what everyone else has to say about this. 
Yeah, indeed. It's a real learning experience for all of us at the moment, isn't it, about how different people perceive things and the way in which we're beginning to embrace it more thoroughly. Uh, Dirk Solner uh, joins us. He's a leading coach and trainer with a solopreneurial flair. He focuses on strengthening people and teams empathetically and competently and reinvesting in people. He combines teaching in the Nord Academy in Hamburg with leadership coaching and development for his clients as well. So he's a busy guy and we really appreciate him joining us today on the panel. Dirk, welcome back to Level Up. Oh, hello, Nick, and hello, community out there. Uh, I'm happy to be here again, and I hope to contribute some human intelligence in combination with service management and personal development. So um, we need, I think we need artificial intelligence even more. We need human intelligence and we need conversations and exchange among human experts. And so I'm happy to be part of that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, Level Up is all about the conversation. It's all about the questions and the answers and the different interaction between the panel. So it's a really great um, vehicle, I think, for us to be able to explore this properly. Falco Werner um, completes our panel um, today. He's the co-founder and agile coach over at Vempio, helping his clients double the effectiveness of their teams in a matter of weeks. An accomplished author himself in his own right, he studied IT engineering engineering and has a passion for world-class technology. So welcome back to Level Up, Falco. Brilliant to see you again. Thanks a lot for introducing. Um, I really love being here explaining and learning from other panelists. Um, always a fun, fun thing to do and, um, and enjoying it, especially on the topic of AI um, being, yeah, state-of-the-art tools to help humans create a better work. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Now, the show doesn't work without great questions from the audience, and great questions need a great question master. So joining us from the beautiful garden city of Bengaluru in southern India is Suchitra Jacob. Suchitra, welcome back to Level Up. How are you today? Hi, Nick, and hello to the panelists and our viewers. I'm doing well, thank you, and I'm looking forward to today's show, particularly on AI. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm really pleased that none of us have been replaced by some sort of animated bot. Okay. So we are genuinely, everybody, just to, just for you to know, we are the genuine real articles. All right. We are not a meta human um, or anything like that. Okay. So brilliant. So look, very good. Let's jump straight in, if we may, Suchitra, and we'll take our first question, please. Sure. Our first question is from Nancy Hollow. Should AI make decisions or merely prepare them? And how can this be neatly demarcated? Mm, it's a really interesting question, Nancy, isn't it? Because, you know, it's, it's really kind of thinking about, you know, should we let the machine go first or should we let the machine inform our decision making? Dirk, why don't you start us off and then we'll hear from Falco. Oh, thank you. So I think AI, uh, AI is built for making decision. Um, and so one, one point from that, uh, I, 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 e, oh, sorry for that. Uh, AI um, systems are built for making decisions. So it's up to us to, to put the machines in the place where they make decisions, where they have the, the, the right knowledge to make decisions. And, um, and we, we always in the past built machines to make uh, decisions. Um, um, if you're looking into to DevOps or, or automation, machines are um, making decisions. So uh, a, uh, AI is built for making decisions. And uh, so it's up to us to put them into place uh, where they make, where they can make good, uh, good decisions and uh, not horrible decisions. <laughs> it's, it's very important, isn't it? And you know, if you if you're really good at this kind of work, then you can break those big decisions down into smaller steps. And perhaps a machine is more capable of of being programmed in order to be able to cope with the small <clears> steps. <throat> so yeah, some really great thinking. Thank you for um, for starting us off um, on that um, on that topic. Thank you so much, uh, Falco. Your thoughts, please, and then we'll go to Stefan. All right. Um I'm saying that um, computers and machines are there to help make big decisions by 
providing small decisions on things where humans can't cope. So if you do, if you think about having hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes or terabytes of data, humans can't process that in a good way. And there we can make use of um, artificial intelligence, machine learning and other techniques. Um, and that's that's the main purpose for, for AI to really help um, build good decisions. Um, so far, I think the real important decisions should still be supported and worked on with AI in combination of humans, make that combination work best. Yeah, absolutely. I was reading um, some of the scale that this technology is running at now. Um, and uh, you have millions upon millions upon millions of decision making um, steps now that uh, the larger, more powerful platforms are able to take for you. So it really does um, operate at significant scale and pace. Thank you very much indeed, Falco. Um, Stefan and then Ahmed. Has CI really been made to make decisions? I'm not sure because it is. it can only be as good as the algorithm is and as good as the data. What's lacking, what's really missing is uh, all the emotional imp impact, uh, socially, or whatever, what human intelligence does. Now, you can, of course, um, distinguish um, a decision or at least a fact decision or a preparation, a summary. I don't know if you know about this uh, lawyer in New York City just uh, some time ago, used ChatGPT to prepare for a court application. And ChatGPT did that, f completed all the forms and everything. The problem that all the references and the file numbers and everything was fake. So it was kind of embarrassing, kind of embarrassing. An example where a human was relying on AI that made a decision for, for him, uh, instead of using that and make that always important mandatory double check. Interesting, interesting. Thank you very much indeed, <laughs> Stefan. Uh, Ahmed, your thoughts, please. Yeah, I mean, I'll just echo the same point which Stefan just mentioned. I mean, the AI is here just for the sole purpose to improve the humanity, the way we live, the way we practice our business operations or whatever you can call it as. So my thing is AI is basically helps us like, you know, providing all that ingredients to reach to the point where we can take effective and efficient and timely decisions in terms of like, you know, producing uh, more um, predictable activities or predictable models in, in, in order to improve our uh, business operations and the life in general. So the decisions is primarily like, you know, has to be shaded. If, if they, if they, if if the, the decision making process is being automated through a an, an machine learning process, of course, there has to be a human interference there, not to decide completely like what is best for humans. So it should be a shared responsibility. Okay, it's a, that shared responsibility. I think um, I think you're so right, Ahmed. And you know, to Stefan's point a little earlier, you know, it, it's it's the interaction, it's the blending, if you like, of the AI platforms with uh, the human um, elements that produce the better results in the shorter periods of time, and therefore the more, you know, kind of productivity um, uh, and so on. Um, let's, if we can, jump over to social, and we'll just have a quick look at uh, all the different folks who are joining. So Babu, thank you so much for joining over from um, Chennai, a short uh, train ride. Well, not that short, actually, from um, Bengaluru, but uh, anyway, nonetheless, anyway, great um, for you to join us. And um, Syl, fantastic, from the West Coast 
uh, California. So um, it's, it's either very late for you or very early, depending on which way that you, that you look at things. Justin is um, joining us from Harare in Zimbabwe. So great to have you on the team today, Justin. And Idara, welcome back uh, from Nigeria, a regular contributor in the chat and part of the community. Really lovely to have you on board with us today. Excellent. Okay, well, let's press on if we can, and we'll take our next question, please. Suchitra. Sure. We have another question from Nancy. Do we have an ethical and moral obligation in the further development of AI? Okay, really, <laughs> that's a really good question. Falco, start us off. Is there an ethical and moral obligation to keep on with this technology? Well, as I said before, I see AI as a tool. So we are developing it. And based on that, we are also uh, responsible for what we do with it in terms of further development, as well as um, how we use it. So it's, from my perspective, important that we as a society decide how we want to have this tool used. We have examples like um, Italy switching off ChatGPT for some time in the past and then deciding to, to reuse it. We see the development of those tools and, and therefore we, we should support um, the developers in providing guidelines on um, how development should be done and also give guidelines. To it is useful and helpful to use these tools. Um, there are trainings available, there are um, experience exchanges, unities available. My take on it. Back to you. Okay, thank you um, so much indeed. Um, uh, let's move on. Just broke up just a little bit there, Falco. So I might come back to you um, again, just for the very last part of, of that answer um, next time around. Um, Stefan, uh, your thoughts, please, and then we'll hear from Dirk. Do we have an ethical <clears throat> obligation? Of course we do. The question is if that is the same as setting rules. I mean, OpenAI have uh, asked or demanded that there are rules be set for what they develop which sounds a bit crazy to me when you think that you do something and then ask others to build the fence around you um, is not necessarily um, <clears throat> about filling up or fulfilling a moral obligation yourself if you're calling for the politics to do that. As far as I'm now, the only, only organizations who are doing this at the moment is the European Union. They're looking for something on the other hand. If you set rules and the stricter you set the rules, some countries have not allowed to clone a sheep. Uh, other people have cloned sheep and chicken and whatsoever when that technology came in. Um, and, and the world's still spinning. It hasn't cost humanity um, uh, to, to die. Um, but there is an obligation of whatever we do, how we use artif artificial intelligence and how we develop it further. And in particular, if it's machine learning, it is a lot on us how to train that machine. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> and, I, and I think what you're saying there, that there is this obligation, there is this obligation, you know, now whether it's, um, you know, done in all countries at the same pace, nonetheless, humanity has this kind of, you know, we've invented something, so we need to kind of, you know, be able to, you know, manage <coughs> that through. Um, <coughs> so really good points. Thank you so much. And uh, Dirk, let's hear from you and then we'll go to Ahmed. Uh, so I want to add something to uh, to Stefan and to, to Falco, com combine their answers. So um, uh, Falco said that AI is a, is a tool, and that's right. And uh, Stefan said it's not enough only to set rules. Uh, if you look at cars, cars are um, tools. Like you can go from point A to point B. And every uh, country has set some rules not to drive fast, faster than maybe 50 kilometers per hour or something like that. But um, some guys are, um, uh, are not uh, looking on those rules. So we have to work on personal responsibility. Every human being has to look on personal responsibility um, again um, or just we have to have rules, but we have to work as human beings, and we all have to use it in the right way. 
Thank you very much indeed. Um, really good points. Thank you so much, Dirk. Uh, Ahmed, your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Jan Willem. Yeah, my take on this thing is it's it's a very important responsibility to on the society to establish the uh, unit expectations from the upcoming this you know the new field a new era of artificial intelligence in terms of ethics. Considering the core purpose of this new technology is to improve the way of living, so we should define those bound, ethical boundaries, moral boundaries, while developing the rules within the machine learning algorithms. That means it should not be the harming technology, or in other words, like you know those all those means for where the um, you know, the human privacy is being violated, should be considered carefully as well. A chat, all the chat, kind of chatbots are pulling the personal data without um, securing a consent. So that's what became a very reason that uh, European Union has came up with the European um, Union AI Act, highlighting the very, very rules that, you know, while developing the artificial intelligence systems, they need to consider these fundamental rules of ethics and establish, you know, some moral disciplines and boundaries while developing and practicing, um, you know, the such solutions and, uh, you know, the services. So my take is, is yes, I mean, it has to, it, it comes down to the responsibility of each and every company who is engaged in developing and offering such solutions. Thank you very much indeed, Jan Willem. You're, you're working at the leading edge of much of this. Um, ethical and moral obligations, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that um, to kind of give a, a very fast and straight and, uh, and forward answer to the question is that do we have an ethical and moral obligation for the development? The answer is absolutely yes. I think everyone is on the same page there. The, Difficulty comes in when we start talking about, well, how are we going to safeguard that? And where does that responsibility lie? Because we are dealing with technology that is going across any kind of international boundary that exists um, and also is having an impact in ways that cannot be controlled by governments or corporations. So it's not so much as a responsibility just on the legislation alone. There will need to become um, very significant efforts in educating people who actually use these tools to differentiate between what is real, what is fake, which information can I trust? So it's, it's a little bit more of a complex debate than just the, the regulations in my approach, in my opinion. It's, it is quite interesting, isn't it, panel, where, you know, initially there's, um, you know, an immediate response, and uh, but the actual, the detail of the how, <laughs> Needs a lot of thought, needs a lot of thought. And what was fascinating, I think, just from as an outsider kind of watching this, was the number of founding fathers or founding parents of artificial intelligence kind of suddenly became media personalities, you know, for about a you know month, two months or so, as the various news organizations were trying to get some context, you know, we're trying to understand the how and, you know, beyond the what, but actually beginning to think about the how at any rate. So, yeah, really interesting. And thank you so much, Nancy. Really two excellent, insightful questions to open the show with. Um, Suchitra, if we may, let's move on. We'll take our next question, please. Sure, we have a live question from Irfan. How does AI contribute to project management? Uh, okay, now project management, of course, is right at the heart of the professional community that APMG has been working with for 30 years, actually. It's our 30th birthday this year. Stefan, why don't you start us off with your thoughts on AI in the world of project management? Yes. Um so first of all, project management is very often about human interaction. Um, it's about addressing a team, um, making sure people do their job. So I think it is a very good example where AI can become a the most efficient supporting function first, where you get together all the facts, all the data that you need. I think it has been mentioned before. 
um, that I think Falco said that, that processing so much data, um, <clears throat> why not let a machine do that? Like the old hippie dream always was, let the computers do the routine work. Now, on the other hand, human interaction can become difficult if it's remote working teams or if, if there are whatever, everybody in change management who has ever done changes knows that as well. And I've recently heard that AI can even help there to give advice. How do I interact with team members the best, to get the best out of it, even if it's just reminding myself of being a bit more empathetic than just bringing down my point. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, very good. So there's pluses and minuses then in the, in the world of PM. Um, Dirk, your thoughts, please, and then we'll hear from Falco. So as uh, <clears throat> as Stefan said, project management is is human work. Um, so um, you may ask ChatGPT or other artificial intelligence uh, systems, and they will help you. But uh, they won't help you in getting in personal contact, uh, in practicing um, those tips you may get from artificial, artificial intelligence. And I think uh, three months ago, I had a, um, an episode for my own podcast. It's a German podcast. And for that, I asked ChatGPT, please help me. I have problems with my team as a as a as a leader so and chat gpt helped me a little bit getting started how do i prepare some workshops and it was really helpful but getting uh, going deeper i asked him to uh, something to uh, tell me uh, about the belbin model i don't know if you know belbin um so and he was giving me wrong answers he was not sure if there are eight roles or nine roles. And uh, he, he, uh, he, he repeated that failure. So check the uh, information you get. And uh, that needs that you are more intelligent than the system. More prepared, yeah, more quite trained. Deep. It's quite interesting, isn't it? It's worthwhile considering a couple of key things about version four of uh chat gpt which i i believe is the one that you know we're all interacting with at the moment um and that there are these limitations you know and to be fair as well meredith belbin's work and by the way i'm a great fan of belbin mm. um his work evolved over a period of time and some of those roles in the early research, the names <laughs> changed a little, and it has evolved. So, to be fair, I, th I think there's you know um, reasonable causality kind of in in all of that. Uh, Falco, your thoughts, please. Um... <clears throat> okay, looking back to the question, um, how does AI contribute to project management? I would say there are a few points where you can look into. For example, automating routine tasks like um, getting people to join meetings is something you can have AI supporting with looking through calendars, matching times and uh, things like that. Um, assisting with decision making somehow. So gathering data, I think that's what Stefan meant um, earlier. Um, preparing decisions. Um, if there is an architectural topic or something like that, gather the relevant data and then give AI one of the uh, votes on um, um, going left or right in such decisions. Um, also, cost estimation could be something where, where you could try to look into uh, AI-supported, um, model-supported topics. Um, what else? Um, yeah, creating efficiencies with routine tasks is probably the, the first step I would I would take um, to to really get more out of AI. Next to what Dirk and Stefan already said. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, Falco. And in fact, you you covered some of the points that I was going to mention. <laughs> one one thing about AI is that <clears throat> I think it's worthwhile considering at the moment that you know we keep talking about explicit. Um, engines, the large language model engines like ChatGPT, where you go to a particular URL and you type something in and you know that you're interacting with an artificial intelligence large language model um, engine. But actually, on project management, I would suggest to you that the biggest productivity gain is in the embedded AI that's already available to you. 
So in your Microsoft products, <laughs> and the most commonly downloaded template format in the planet for project management is an Excel template. So in Excel, you have a huge range of embedded AI now that you're able to call upon to get the mundane things, the basic things, as Falco says, um, executed quickly and productively without um, too much concern. Um, Falco, uh, final thoughts on this? Just adding on, on your thoughts, um, if you're talking about AI, then that's also um, scanning documents and making text out of it. If you have meetings and want to go through um, meeting minutes and um, document those, um, record the meeting, put it into an, a large language model and uh, doing things like that. So there, there are lots of tiny things where you really uh, save a lot of time. Try to find out. Absolutely. Those. Absolutely agree. I think it could become the project management and the PMO's best friend, actually, in a lot of these <laughs> kinds of tasks which need to be done and don't necessarily by themselves bring a rewarding afternoon, especially if it's a Friday afternoon and you're kind of thinking you want to spend your time in a different way. Very good. Um, Suchitra, let's move on. If we can, please, we'll take our next question to the panel. We have another live question from Charlotte. I have read on BBC that people are using ChatGPT to learn new languages to enhance their career. Is this a good practice? Okay, well, I would I would say the, the, the BBC is the national broadcaster in the UK. Anything that helps English people learn other languages has <laughs> got to be good, all right? Because we don't, we don't have a strong reputation internationally for modern languages. Stefan, start us off, and then we'll hear from Ahmed. <clears throat> Charlotte, the answer is yes and no. Well, yes, because uh, it's always a good practice, as Nick says, uh, to find ways to learn a new language. Um, I'm using another tool, not ChatGPT, another tool to learn better Dutch. Um, and then I realized, because it's also listening to my pronunciation, that this is a pronunciation the people in the area I live in don't speak. So it all depends on how the system has been trained, which leads to me, and that's the no part of my answer, uh, <clears throat> that I still have to go to a classical school once an evening a week um, to improve the Dutch in the area where I live in. And it's practice, practice, okay. practice. So when Nick does his motorbike rides into Germany, he should speak German and listen to German. <laughs> I, I, I really, I really, absolutely should. I did meet um, um, uh, initially um, quite a surprised farmer driving the largest tractor that I've ever seen um, on a on a ride in Germany. But we'll come back to that another day. Ahmed, your thoughts? Can ChatGPT is it good practice to learn languages through it? Yeah, that's exactly um, um, very much. You know depends on the purpose why we need to learn the new languages for I mean, if that's for the career reason and the role is very much like you know where you need to get engaged with the customers in speaking yes I mean, the speaking cannot be learned from the chat dpt chat dpt may able to help like enhancing the vocabulary or or a better comprehension in writing skills though or maybe up to some extent reading but not speaking and writing. So, so, but it will take away your writing skills though. So, uh, so that depends on what sort of career you're looking forward. If that's more uh, customer engaging roles, then no. And if you are just like in a, in a passive role uh, in the back end, where you just need to uh, prepare something and then you send across uh, with of, of uh, chat GPT, yes, that really helps. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Dirk, your thoughts, then we'll hear from Falco. So thank you, Nick. Uh, if you look at the panelists, we have a German majority speaking oh, English. Indeed. <laughs> indeed. Okay. So um, <laughs> going, go, <laughs> going back to, to, the, to the question, I think, um, yes, it is good practice. It's a new and a, diff, a different kind. Um, I am not, um, I will not use it because I'm learning by reading and talking, going into human interaction. But I know there are many people who go to YouTube. My 
daughter um, built the house, not built, but uh, uh, made it uh, new only by watching YouTube videos. It's not not my point of view, and I'm not doing. I was helping her, but she learned a lot via YouTube. So every new kind of learning, every new tool, gets you more uh, options to learn something. Absolutely right. It's so, so important, isn't it, to, to be curious. And on behalf of an entire nation, I, I apologise um, for the way in which the English are quite so insular when it comes to modern languages. Um, there's a bit of history there, I think. OK, um, Falco, your thoughts, please. And then we'll hear from Jan Willem. All right. Uh, what I like about um, ChatGPT is that you interact like with kind of similar to to humans so you can you can chat you can be in touch and uh, um, it's engaging actually I, I sometimes like to to chat and um, just for for the sake of it and tying someone in into a new language for example um, that might help um, what what I also would uh, say you're missing the pronunciation and talking part so from from a written perspective that's good but from from the from the auditory oral perspective, really talking to people, um, their their differences, their emotions, uh, that's something that's probably being lost on uh, uh, learning another language through ChatGPT. Um, I like, for example, to to listen to um, podcasts, to ebooks, and other things to have at least the practice in other languages. Um, yeah, often it's English. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's German. Um, but um, past, um, I was watching to a um, Star Trek series and having the um, under subtitles in uh, in Dutch because uh, currently I'm working in a project with a few Dutch people and uh, there I'm I'm trying to to practice a little bit of that language and since i'm watching that uh, tv series anyway um i added that so th there are lots of things lots of ways to to practice languages um especially when i look to the new northern european countries there's not so many people so it's not worth to have um translations also uh, synchronized so they often listen to the english language um shows and reading the uh, subtitles in their local language. So that's where I experienced the need for learning a language when I was a student ex on a student exchange to um, Sweden for two weeks and saw all the Swedish um, students in the same age were very proficient and fluently speaking English. And I was like uh, stumbling along. And uh, that's that's what, what I see. Um, is more important to to learn the language to talk to people. The the advantage with ChatGPT is it understands all the languages that it's made for. So you can talk to it in German, Dutch, or uh, English. Um, that's nice, but um, missing the point. Okay, thanks so <clears throat> so much indeed. It's very important from an accessibility point of view, isn't it? If you're going to have a, you know, generative AI model where you can interact with it in a normal human conversation, that ChatGPT does um, able is rather able to understand different languages. Um, Jan Velen, your thoughts on this? Is it a good idea to to use it to learn different languages? Well, I think, as you said in the beginning, anything that can help the British learn new languages is uh, definitely a good step in the right direction. Um, Once again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but um, the um, whether ChatGPT is the best tool in order to do that is something I think we can debate uh, in more detail. But the underlying question that is, I think, very interesting is how is AI changing language in education. Because mm. um, obviously ChatGPT is just the, the, the language model, but the technology behind AI could help you to also tailor a, a learning experience completely based on your input and your progress and your educational uh, capabilities. It could help you focus on pronunciation that you find difficult it could build a tailored program for you that is helping you to learn faster compared to a traditional program. So the underlying developments that is changing language education as a whole 
that is the real interesting question that AI does facilitate. Um, we're nowhere near those tools yet, but I think ChatGPT is, is a good first step in that direction. Yeah, absolutely right. Thank you. And um, there was some work some years ago done by one of the Australian telecoms companies to provide um, uh, near real time audio translation for telephone calls. Um, eastern side of Australia um, has a very um, integrated community with a large number of um, Southeast Asian and Asian countries. And so it's a real challenge for people to be able to organize and conduct transactions and so on. Um, and that was actually very successful in many ways, um, although spookily was quite difficult when it came to financial services because the trust factor um, became the undermining <laughs> undermining key thing. How can you trust something which is automated? And this sense of trust and um, uh, can is it telling me the right things um, in human conversation is very important because we place great emphasis on the nuance. And um, it was it was what made me laugh so much and respond so positively to the panel. It was not what you said, but how you said it <laughs> around the English and learning different languages. So thank you very much for that. That shows how advanced you are and how limited my foreign language skills actually are in real life. So there we go. Let's move on if we can. <laughs> Help me out. Dig me out of this language hole, please, Sachitra. Let's move on. We'll take our next question. Our next question is from Milvio. How can AI overcome cognitive bias in decision making? Ah, now, this is quite fascinating, isn't it? Because whatever decisions we take, we often include a sense of our own perspective in taking those decisions, which may be expressed as cognitive bias um, in certain circumstances. Uh, Jan Vella, what are your thoughts on cognitive bias and overcoming them with AI? Yeah, I, I think that this is actually one of the best questions uh, uh, so far uh, in the sense that it really is asking beyond the technology itself. And in order to answer this, um, we're, we're getting towards a very fundamental point in AI. Uh, and that is that most people, or at least the ones that I've spoken to, know how to use it and they understand the implications and the technology itself. But very few people understand how these models are being made. What's the algorithm underneath actually looks like? How is it trained? How do all these machine learning algorithms actually work? And even fewer uh, people are able to read and program them and understand where cognitive bias is coming from. So um, that also brings me, me to, to the answer to this question. Well, in order for us to start avoiding this, we first need to have a better understanding of how those machine learning models are being developed. What are the uh, premises and the data upon which these elements are being trained? And only if we understand that, then we can use it to overcome any kind of bias that is baked into the algorithm itself. The difficult part is that most organizations that develop AI algorithms for proprietary reasons will not share exactly how their algorithms are being developed and to what extent bias is in or excluded. So you're bringing up a very, very fundamental point because until we have openness and we can view how an algorithm is created and how it might lead towards a certain bias, this question will not be able to, will not be able to answer. Thank you very much. Great intro into quite a deep um, question from Milvio. Thank you so much, Milvio. Falco, your thoughts? Then we'll hear from Ahmed. Okay. Um, first of all, we should think about what are cognitive biases. There are things that the human brain and the training that we have in our heads are uh, are there because we have two types of um, decision-making process. Um, there's a nice book from Daniel Kahneman, Slow Thinking, Fast Thinking, um, that explains a lot of it. Um, um, the fast thinking is based on experience and um, re reduces the cost of really thinking because thinking is a very energy efficient part of the brain. Um, it really takes a lot of um, energy to um, really think about something. And that's why we have um, fast decision making processes. If we use this by training 
models in in AI, then we take the same things into the decision process of the AI system. And that's why we should be aware of what are the types of um, biases. In some of the trainings that we give, we uh, mention survivorship bias, where we like look on only parts of the available data. So big, big thing is use large data sets, um, analyze those, um, provide objective <coughs> insights by having a diverse um, group of people training the models with different uh, approaches. Um, and um, yeah, you could also train AI to recognize bias and take this out. So uh, train the AI to reduce bias. So there are lots of um, direct applications of understanding the um, basics, the sources, and the training processes uh, in that. So you could include that into some regulations and guidelines when creating AI decision uh, systems. It's, it's really, really interesting the way in which human brains work and we build patterns in our own memory of different situations for us to be able to draw upon. On the one hand, we're leveraging our real life experience. And so a senior person who's been running lots of projects and dealing with complexity and managing different situations is often you know in a better place to be able to take decisions um, but then the apple cart is completely overturned when genuinely new thinking is needed to innovate <laughs> so we have this peculiar situation don't we as humans between our kind of you know our current state and our future state and needing to be able to bridge from one world into the next so thank you very much um Indeed, uh, Volker. Ahmed, we'll hear from you and then we'll hear from Stefan. Yeah, I mean, this is, first of all, I would like to appreciate uh, the, the person who has asked this very important question, which is uh, one of the, I think, the uh, <coughs> complex problem in designing the decision systems today. So, um, which is, you know, uh, the way it is recommended uh, to, to overcome these bias. Uh, is in three steps. The very first thing is like when first from a human behavior point of view, that when we need to, to understand that how human respond to such situations. For example, like, you know, when in, in certain geographies, we say we start the dialogue with hi, and some in hello, and some in good morning, and so forth. So that we need to basically really understand well uh, in order to within the context of cultural values and the geography second thing is of course the algorithm uh, which comes into the play which is of course is a software and that can it has to be improved with the practice and practice and and through an iterative model the third and most important point which makes the rest of the two um, successful is the very important point which I highlighted during the introduction that I will explain what is IA later. There's no AI without IA. I mean, IA stands for information architecture. So the how and what information we are collecting and feeding into the AI engine is, is all about the success story. If we are not making sure that the data we are collecting and feeding into the machine learning or the deep learning engine, it is accurate, complete, timely, and reliable. Then, of course, we cannot rely on the decisions with AI as it is to us. It's really, it's really, it's really important, isn't it? Um, I'm going to come back to some of that. I love the information architecture bit, and the uh, I like alliteration, so I enjoy words, and I enjoy AI and IA, and that's very meaningful for me, Ahmed. So, I'm just made a little electronic note of that one. I'm going to come back to that one myself, um, with some more thinking. Stefan, your thoughts on this, please. Yeah, <clears throat> try to make it short. I mean, we had this earlier when, when there was the question about project management. So if it's my cognitive bias, and mine might be different from Jan Willems or from Dirks or from Falco or Ahmed, um, <clears throat> then I think AI can overcome my cognitive bias 
um, when I'm looking for how do I get a team member back to work, uh, where I say, not again, this person, he'd done that before. So where's all my cognition actually coming from? Well, well, AI can just give me the objective roadmap of what to do, which will help me to overcome cognitive bias. But in principle, I'm with Jan Willem, who said in the beginning, there's really no real answer to this in the future. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so um, a, a couple of things for you. I mean, one was one that you might like to look at, uh, Melvi, and by the way, thank you so much for, for the question. There's a really interesting study by um, uh, a psychologist, Jenis, in the 1930s, and he did the jelly beans in the jar, probably not doing his research technique justice here by describing it as that. But in essence, he put a problem to groups of people and said, guess how many jelly beans are in the jar? Now, the jar had an enormous number of jelly beans, but people guessed a wide variety of different um, numbers, of course. And then he put them into groups. And in the group, they had a discussion with each other. So the first guess was on your own. The second guess, you got the chance to reframe your guess, having had the conversation with others. Now, men generally changed their, their estimate by around about 250 or so. And um, the women in the group changed their estimate by a higher value. And so his argument was that there's a huge degree of bias depending on where we are taking the decision. You know, if we're taking it on our own, we will come to one conclusion. If we take it as a community with others, we will come to a different con conclusion. But the human being's view is that you're more likely to be able to trust the community. So therefore, <laughs> therefore, the bigger the sample size, the better the IA, more likely, uh, the, the likelihood is, the probability is, is that humans will trust it more when the sample size is greater. Just say. All right, very good. Thank you uh, very much indeed, panel. Brilliant question, Melvio. Let's move on. Sushita, if we can, we'll take our next question, please. Sure. We have a question from Robert. Will AI in the future replace IT people like programmers and testers, or will it more be like an integration of the two worlds? Ah, okay. Interesting question, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, Ahmed, start us off, then we'll hear from Stefan. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the the most important um, question so far, and then I appreciate the, the person who asked uh, this question. I think uh, we have been, um, from past couple of decades, we're into this dilemma that when AI would replace the idea the, the you know the skilled people and all, and so forth which my take on this thing it's not it's always um, ever changing roles and the way we work today I mean for example the programmer used to write the codes 20 years back today with the use of AI tools they produce more faster and more relevant code in less time but doing the same thing, producing, the, developing the programs. So it is uh, transforming roles. It's going to result in transforming some, like the way, uh, the roles, the way we do the business and work, but not replace people because end of the day, people will decide the way forward with the use of AI tools. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Steph, and next, please. And then we'll hear from Dirk. <clears throat> Whenever there is a change, then there is uh, so also a change to the, to, to the, to the jobs. Like, I mean, bef there were no IT people before the computer was invented. And um, when it became a mass production, then there were IT people. Now, what they did was they replaced, the IT people were actually the replacers of some other jobs that have been there before, mostly routine jobs. So they will not replace IT people, but the jobs will become different. <clears throat> An IT person is not the same as it used to be when you think of these data centers with the IBM mainframes in it. It is, that time is over. 
They're different times, so there will be different jobs. Testers don't test anymore what they used to test, like 10, 20 years ago, because some of that has been done by chatbots or, or other technology. So yes, I think there will be an integration of the two worlds, but over time, the job description might change. So what is an IT person today might be an AI programmer in the future. Um, we don't know that. But most likely, that's where, where we're shifting in that direction. If we just look at the history of society, uh, whatever happens, some jobs will completely disappear and new will be formed. It's certainly true, isn't it? You know, the, 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 the top and the bottom of this is, is that, you know, the roles that we had available to us as careers, you know, um, when we were kind of leaving school or university are very different to the opportunities that are available today. And that does happen with each generation. So um, I don't see it as being any particularly different. Um, you're right, it's just transformative and things are going to change at a faster pace. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Dirk, final thoughts on this? Just one sentence, just one quote. Um, Artificial intelligence replaces people who do not use artificial intelligence. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you heard that here first, I think, anyway, from uh, Dirk Solner. So we need to copyright that one, um, Dirk. That's definitely got, you know, um, legs to it. <laughs> Okay. All right. Very good. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. What a brilliant question. Thank you so much, Robert, because it's something that's on lots and lots of people's minds. You know, how do how do I continue to add value? Um, I would say be a better human. Be a better human, all right, to DX point. Use the tools that are available to you, add value to them, and, uh, you know, you will really be able to progress. So um, closing remarks, uh, Dirk and then Stefan. Oh, sorry, uh, me? Dirk, your, oh. close, your, uh -oh. yeah, your, your closing remarks for the show, please. Always the same. I'm happy to be here um, because I'm learning right now. I'm sharing knowledge and uh, I get some really good, good, uh, good thoughts about and so thank you, Nick. Thank you, APMG. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Stefan and then Jan Bellum. Just the last advice to all of our audience viewers here is take that quote that Dirk has brought up and try to get familiar with artificial intelligence, try to use it, try to find out yourself how to use it best in your career and then advance your career in that. S try to see a point where you can get trained in the principle because very often all these questions come with an abstract fear as a background and the only way to overcome abstract fear is actually to, to get a touch on it to, to touch base with it so that would be my advice other than that thanks panel it was great working with you here thanks nick for the invitation okay thanks so much indeed jan bellum and then ahmed i would like to build a little bit of that on what stefan just mentioned and um, I would even go one step further is if you really want to understand how AI can, can, AI can be used or can change your career, you should not, not just look at how to use it in your work, but you should also look beyond the application itself and understand how AI technically works so that it helps you to improve your decision making. And other than that, I, I also would like to thank the whole panel for uh, this wonderful discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, Ahmed and then Falco. Yeah, I mean, I used to say 10 years back, you know, the future is the future is of A, B, C. A is for artificial intelligence, B for, is for blockchain and C is for cloud and cybersecurity. But it is now, I think it's no more future, it's a present. Every system is being developed using such base technologies and uh, looking forward in developing the industry focus expertise so it's became a lifestyle now uh, which is do your work with innovation so ai is your tool so i i would like to thank you the panel you know the share uh, the thought leaders who have shared the panel with me and the with such a wonderful questions the audience was today 
I was really amazed. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic questions from our audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Ahmed, we appreciate it. Uh, Falco, final thoughts, then we'll hear from Suchitra. Yeah, thanks. It was great again to be here to learn and uh, share a few of my thoughts. Um, some of them were actually inspired by Perplexity AI, not um, the tool um, in focus, but um, some of the thoughts um, are augmented. <laughs> um, um, it's always fun to to use those tools and get get some inspirations and then make it um, your own. Um, take this as an example and uh, try to think about a quote um, from Alan Turing: um, "AI is when you can uh, mock the human so that the human thinks is uh, something in other." Way. So from, from that point of view, um, helpful in, in your real life work. Thank you so much indeed. Um, so Chitra, um, an interesting uh, kind of gamble, really, if I can use that word, through <laughs> um, the area of artificial intelligence today. We touched on projects and programs. We touched on, you know, small steps forward and giant leaps forward as well. Your thoughts on today? Absolutely. We've had some great questions and we have more questions actually lined up. So we should, you know, do the show again with this topic. But thank you to our viewers and of course our panelists for your thoughts. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Great job, um, everybody online. Thank you so much for joining us. Huge number of people actually um, over on the in, on the inline chat. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, panel. We really do appreciate it. I'd like to thank um, our producers online, of course, for your excellent questions today. Really great job. And do watch out for your name in the credits if your question was selected. Um, so look, well done, everybody. Over on our website, you can search for the answers to more than 1500 questions, I think. Uh, it's very comprehensive and it really does give you some great guidance and advice. Don't forget that you can listen as well to the audio versions of all of the shows on your favorite podcast platform. Just um, search for APMG International, level up your career, and you'll find us pretty easily and pretty quickly. If you're in London tomorrow over here in the UK, then do pop along to the Agile Business Products event on the latest trends in project management. Um, you can rejoin us here, of course, Friday afternoon, UK time, 2 p.m. Um, we'll be looking at securing your future with better project delivery, so better outcomes there from projects. And on Monday, the 3rd of July, we're going to be exploring how to become a change manager. Subscribe to the show and we'll send you a personal summary of what's coming up, of course, and how you two can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. We'll see you next time.